Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to St. Petersburg State Electrotechnical University. We are quite a large group, we are the team, which are greeting you from uh, the rector's meeting room. And I'm introducing uh, the people who are present here. First of all, I'd like to introduce Anastasia Minina, our speaker for today. Anastasia is the Vice Rector for International Relations. And next to her, you can see a tiny flag of Letio. It's small. It's our signage for today. Small because we're not going to talk much about ourselves. We will be talking about the future of universities, future universities, and the university future. In a certain way, this future is represented here by the rest part of our audience. These are our students. And maybe those of you who saw the videos uh, can recognize faces. Some faces may seem familiar to you. They were our narrators in the video and they joined us for today. Now I'd like to tell about uh, the persons and organizations who really made it happen. Uh, first of all, this is Nufik Nessa, Russia, uh, Netherlands Education Support Center. It is the expertise and service center for internationalization and education. If you think about education in the Netherlands or any exchanges with the Netherlands University, this is the right contact for you, Nufik Nessa. But it's not only that. Nufik Nessa is famous in Russian academic circles for its Dutch science talks. Actually, this is the Dutch science talks. So these science talks, they cover a wide range of subjects, of course, uh, focusing on modern education and research. Uh, the subject of aging universities, of course, uh, is very important, not only for Russia, but also for other countries. And Nufik Nessa helped us to find very knowledgeable speakers. Uh, you will listen to them later today. Uh, another partner of uh, Leti in this endeavor is uh, the Consulate of the Netherlands in St. Petersburg. Uh, the Consulate of the Netherlands in St. Petersburg uh, is very uh, active uh, in supporting vibrant uh, spheres of social life and economy, culture, and of course, education. And by this, I have introduced Ivers Hears, uh, the Deputy Consul General of the Consulate of the Netherlands in St. Petersburg. Ivar, uh, now the floor is yours. Uh, happy to have Ivar here with the greeting speech. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, for uh, the introduction. I hope I can be heard uh, clearly. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Vice Rector, uh, Mrs. Uh, Minina, dear honorary guests, students, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for inviting the Consulate General of the Netherlands to say a few opening words here for this online event. And I see that we have a, a long and impressive list of, of speakers, uh, so I will try to keep it short. Uh, in the first place, I would like to congratulate all the professors and students of the uh, Electrotechnical University with its 135th anniversary. Um, that's a very good age, but I still wish you a lot of uh, successful years ahead. Um, education has, has always been an important factor of, of stability and, and growth for countries. And as, as the world's economies are rapidly transitioning towards more knowledge-based economies, so one could state that education and the way that we deal and look at our universities is becoming even more uh, important that it's a vital factor for, for growth and for well-being. Um, Knowledge-based economies provide an environment where competition is vital. Uh, however, we, we do not only value competition, um, certainly uh, also as the Netherlands, but we also share uh, or um, appreciate knowledge sharing wherever that is possible. And that is also why, as the Netherlands, we, we gladly support these kinds of events, uh, these kinds of international uh, knowledge sharing projects. We appreciate very much uh, the work that we do there with the office of uh, Nafik Nesso in, in Moscow, the representation of Dutch universities here in uh, in Russia. I would like to thank all the guest speakers for their, their willingness to contribute to the discussion uh, today. 
uh, particularly also the two Dutch participants uh, on the program, uh, Mrs. Pascal Leistra, who is a senior architect at uh, Atelier Pro and also a guest teacher at the Technical University of Delft in, in the Netherlands, and Mr. Jasper van Winden, uh, who is a project manager uh, for educational innovations at Utrecht University, also in the Netherlands. So today we will learn more about uh, how uh, to create a comfortable, inclusive and then motivating environment in the modern campus. Uh, without a doubt that uh, today's education requires inspiring and flexible spaces to adapt to uh, rapidly changing societies. And I also think that, well, the, the pandemic that we witnessed in the last year has forced us to, to rethink uh, our ways of living and also uh, the ways that we communicate with each other. So I, I suppose it also uh, for you and for many other universities here in Russia, many things change to an online setting, which can also be part of this future thinking. So thank you all for joining uh, today. I, I wish you a very uh, fruitful discussion and uh, back to you, uh, Tatiana. Oh, thank you, Ivar. Uh, thank you for the bon voyage, for the, so to say, kind of a Dutch blessing uh, for, the, for the discussion. And I'm going to give the floor to Anastasia Minina with the opening speech. Anastasia, the Vice Rector for International Relations, you are welcome. Thank you, Tatiana, for introduction. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm very happy to see each of you, all connections. Um, I will open and start our today discussion with the best international and Russian professionals which develop their campus at their countries. Thank you, colleagues, uh, for your time and for your participation. First of all, our online discussion opens the program, as already told, uh, dedicated to the birthday of our university. And it's really a great time to think about the future. Um, first of all, um, and um, I would like to say that uh, the main train today is uh, the massivization of education. And our university is a very good example. Uh, for example, from 2013 until nowadays, we double the number of students, and it's really a great number today. Uh, and um, it's a great challenge because we have to think about how to um, create comfortable, inclusive, and motivating environment and um, how to, um, to do it uh, with the untouchable heritage and uh, answer a lot of other questions. I ask to open my presentation and, uh, uh, first, and today I would like um, not to speak too much about uh, only our university, but uh, start with us. Um, academic spaces of future universities. So we understand that uh, today the spaces is not only physical spaces, but also digital spaces. Uh, but um, today I would like to show you and uh, get acquainted a little bit uh, with our physical spaces and uh, to, um, to, to speak about it. And uh, start with historical parts of our university and uh, our history in a short, in a short view. Our university is uh, the oldest uh, elected technical university in Europe. Uh, we were founded more than 135 years ago, as you have already known, and uh, our first elected director was the inventor of radio communication, uh, Professor Alexander Popov. And certainly a lot of another famous inventors, scientists, and public figures have studied at work at our university. And uh, I know that today from the short video of our students who are here, uh, you have already known a lot about this, uh, this very famous figures of our university and a little bit uh, get acquainted with the campus, with our campus. And uh, you see on the picture uh, here, our, the most famous view of the, our university is the first building of our university. And uh, it was designed by Alexander Vekshinsky and really a very huge number of money was spent in order to do it. And uh, one history that uh, the construction um, was supervised by Prince Michael, Michael, uh, the youngest brother of the last uh, Russian Tsar Nikolai II. And uh, a lot of money was given by um, our, our another Tsar, Alexander III, and uh, even our university uh, was named after Alexander III. And uh, it was named Electrotechnical Institute of Alexander III. It was such kind of one of the first uh, name of our university. Uh, moreover, 
that's also very interesting. Uh, the first investor of our university was a very large and very known company, Siemens. And uh, we are also proud of it and until now continue to work with this company, this corporation. Uh, next, uh, so you see our first building and uh, I have already told a little bit about it. Our beautiful pictures. Uh, here also uh, our old library, uh, this building, and uh, the, the flat, um, the museum of Alexander Popov, its laboratory, the oldest one and the part of our, uh, the whole museum of our university. Uh, the other building, the second one, uh, and uh, uh, the building D, uh, it was uh, the dormitory of our, for our students, and it really was very comfortable when students studied the university, and at the same time live very near. And uh, the building D was the house for our profes profes professors and their families. So it also was very, very comfortable. But now all these buildings are used uh, as lecture room and as laboratories. So it's uh, such kind of usage of these buildings. You see the picture. Uh, the next uh, also very interesting building is uh, building Saron. And uh, the interest is that uh, it looks like a crosses. And uh, when you look at it, it's really a wonderful construction, uh, but uh, now it's used uh, for administrative departments and uh, more used uh, for such, such kind of needs, not for students. You see it, <clears throat> uh, we understand that no construction and uh, no development at war time, but uh, after the war, uh, the third building was organized at our university and it appeared. And uh, there, is, there is a very big uh, assembly hall for more than 500 students. And uh, now it is administrative building with also lecture and uh, laboratories which are uh, used at now, nowadays for our students. You see this building with very beautiful construction as well. So, uh, and uh, the most uh, modern building of our university is the fifth building. Um, you see the date of his uh, of, of, of its construction. And uh, the interest of this building is uh, that first at first at our university, uh, we divide uh, the lecture part and the laboratory part at this building. And uh, now it's also um, very famous for one of our innovation laboratory uh, connected with nanotechnology. And I will speak a little bit about our laboratories and innovation spaces. Uh, so uh, we select our priority areas of the university. You can see them on the slide. And um, during and according to these uh, priority areas, uh, certainly we develop very, very modern laboratories. Uh, I also show you just some examples. Um, uh, one laboratory, you see it uh, in the left. Uh, the left, a uh, huge one. It was used um, uh, for a very, very big computer. Now it's a very modern laboratory for navigation system and equipment, and uh, we can use it nowadays. Uh, the same, I have already shown you the third building, and uh, now on the bottom of, uh, on the top of this building, uh, a special laboratory polygon for artificial intelligence. Uh, here is also part of our laboratories, nanotechnology, biomedical systems, and uh, and so on. Uh, so we are not stop only on this uh, on these uh, spaces. We continue to develop it, and uh, each time we are thinking about the future and uh, try to renovate some places. About it, I will tell you a little bit later. But now I'll give the floor to another speaker. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anastasia. It was a kind of a submergence, uh, both into the history and the current challenges of our university. Uh, now let's get down to serious business. Uh, next speaker, Dara Melnik, will tell about the current situation in the universities or universities after dark. Quite an intriguing name. Uh, a few words uh, about Dara. Dara is the top Russian expert in uh, the university strategy. Uh, she is uh, the lecturer. Uh, she is the head of research group in Skolkovo Education Development Center uh, in the Moscow School of Management, Skolkovo. Dara, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. I will not um, share the screen with you. I do not have a presentation. I would actually like to have a conversation with all of you and preferably to see your faces, though um, I've noted that people get increasingly uncomfortable with um, turning their cameras on because we feel that it's um, a sort of an intrusion into our private space. Um, so I have four ideas to share with you today. The first one is nothing fundamental has changed. I feel this is really important. Uh, I made all of the conversations about universities uh, dying or universities having to alter absolutely every aspect of their activities after the pandemic, but nothing fundamental has changed. The universities are still um, and they should be involved in their main duties, which is to produce, critique, transfer, and apply knowledge. However, and that's the second idea, some new responsibilities have appeared. Firstly, the pandemic has exposed university shortcomings, which now must be addressed. Um, of course, we knew of them before, but during the pandemic, they kind of came to the surface and we were able to, um, we had the luxury of really facing the problems, which is not the luxury you always have. And it sounds kind of bad, but really you don't often get a chance to truly concentrate on what's wrong. Mostly you just gloss over it or paint over it or ignore it, disavow it, try to somehow live through it without stopping to fix because you have your routine to perform. You have your everyday duties. You have your agenda. Um, but issues such as access, uh, equity and equality, um, pedagogy, um, we suddenly realized that we don't know what we are doing when we teach students. Our pedagogy is not reflective and it's not just about online teaching, it's about teaching as such. Um, and there are many other issues which now must uh, be tackled finally. So that's idea number two. The idea number three is that the forced shutdown, um, the period of, um, well, online learning, uh, isolation, uh, especially social isolation, created a kind of debt uh, which we must now repay. I'm talking about not financial demands um, uh, of students, which uh, universities in some countries have to deal with, but rather intellectual demands and intellectual amends we have to pay now. Um, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about what we missed during those months and what um, higher education institutions in some countries is still missing. And that's an um, um, empathetic nod to Dutch universities. Um, firstly, uh, universities are institutions which create norms, which make you question how you function, what you do, uh, how you think. Uh, they are the places where uh, large uh, concentrations of young people interact with older generations. And that kind of collision creates new norms. And that allows universities to be change makers in their societies, like women's colleges in the 19th century, or student centered universities building one's agency uh, in the 60s. Um, now, universities are spreading such values as internationalization. Um, diversity, entrepreneurship, um, equality, um, also goal orientation, thinking about one's goals, not just following the path of your parents. And um, that is still happening, even if um, our delivery format is online, but it's not happening at the same speed and at the same intensity. The second thing we're missing, and this has been discussed widely, so I will not elaborate, is chance encounters. And the third thing is rituals and ceremonies, which uh, matter for universities, because they balance out this uncertainty, which we get, um, if we are truly, really involved with scholarships, because we set problems, we try to solve them, we face the unknown, we interact with the unknown, we know the things are changing, we're critical towards what's going on around us. 
And that makes us scared. While ceremonies and rituals brings a, bring us cold. Um, graduations happen every year. Um, vivas happen every year. Um, you get certain specific events which mark the passage of time. And for many universities, that is not the case because um, a lot of events, um, in some universities, all the events have been moved online. And while for some ceremonies, uh, this has been a rather good development, I'm talking about PhD vivas, when you actually get some people to listen to you and you know that they are there because they want to be there, not just because you have a room to fill out. Um, but other events like graduations, um are just better offline do we have to talk about that openly it's not the same thing if you receive your diploma via post and you get congratulated via zoom uh, as compared to getting your actual physical diploma from your actual uh, flesh and body uh, dean or rector shaking their hand i remember that moment it's still it, it was a poignant moment and a lot of graduates have missed it. Uh, finally, the fourth thing we're missing, which cannot um, really be transferred to online, is mystery. Um, teaching online and generally conducting business online um, often leads to cognitive overload. Uh, and you don't seek um uh, new things anymore you don't seek new ideas anymore because there are so many ideas hitting you at every single second so that readiness that openness to new ideas is something that a lot of students missed um during the time of lockdown and a lot of students are missing um if we're talking about numbers in the northern hemisphere um, this um, was calculated by my colleague, um, with whom we wrote an article about intellectual amends, Daniel Kantowski, the head of education in the School of Advanced Studies. He calculated the actual percentage of time. So uh, if we're talking about master students uh, who signed up for two years of offline education, um, in 2019, they would spend about 60% of their time, uh, of their learning time, online, and that is if the situation stabilizes in the summer of 2021. If we are talking about uh, students who sign up, um, who are enrolled in three-year programs, that's 40%, and four-year programs, that's 30%. That's a lot, which brings me to my next point. Uh, we have to actually work, work out a strategy for this um, after-dark moment. Um, I like the phrase. Um, it was originally coined by, uh, well, not the phrase, the notion, the idea, the word. Uh, it was originally coined by Haruki Murakami in his novel, After Dark. Um, I'm not sure he means anything specific. Uh, Murakami often operates with feelings and atmosphere and just the um, general, um, sort of situation you're in, which you cannot truly grasp, um, but you can still experience. But for me, after dark means that period when, when all is done, when um, the worst is behind you, when the hero has come back home. And that moment is um, sometimes the scariest one, because what do you do when you don't have to solve problems anymore all the time, when you don't have to <laughs> think about um, making online as good as offline, uh, making hybrid work, um, supporting everyone around you, supporting yourself. What do you do now when everything is, well, better, when it's the dawn already, when the monsters are behind you? Um, I'm referring to um, mythological things and um, epic stories, um, because that feels epic. What has happened to us feels epic. So what do we do now? And that's the question that has some specific answers, which I would love to discuss. But what we came up with um, is just kind of a list of things, what could be done uh, to pay those intellectual amends to students and professors. Um, 
So that's the third idea, a specific set of tactics. Uh, the first one is taking informal education seriously. Um, every student who wants to be engaged in uh, different activities with professors or other students should get the opportunity to do so over the summer, over weekends, over vacations. Um, the opportunities should multiply um, and their number should grow exponentially over the next years just to allow them to catch up somehow. Um, the second is alumni clubs, um, which might give us some chance to catch up with building of cultural and social capital, which is quite important when it comes to your um, education, especially um, undergraduate education, but graduate education as well. Um, tech zoning um, so this is us coming to physical spaces um, we now indeed cannot think of campuses as only physical spaces they're also digital spaces and normative spaces so we can create new norms which zone campuses and say you have places where you can zoom in into a meeting and those places all around the campus. So you can feel both a part of the community and isolate it sufficiently so that you can do your own thing, including doing your own thing online. Um, there should be spaces where uh, hybrid learning um, can happen. And there should be spaces where it is prohibited to use any technology so that we can finally focus, at least sometimes, on just communicating with each other or even with your own self. Um, and finally, uh, the last thing here in the tactics, um, I feel that for a lot of students and a lot of professors, this online and this fusing of personal uh, space and public space, private and public space, um, has led to um, our inability to focus getting worse. And universities might help with that. They might help with creating spaces where it is easy for you to focus. And that might be um, one of the uh, fortune of attention um, when we think about campuses of the future, how to create space uh, where you can truly focus, where nothing is distracting you, but where you still feel that you belong to this intellectual community. Um, and I'm getting to uh, my fourth idea. Um, I'm now um, in Buryatia, out of all places. Uh, that's in Asia for our Dutch friends uh, near Mongolia, but that's a part of Russia. We are working with uh, Irnitu, uh, that's Irkutsk National Research Technical University. And the conversation is quite strong here about university uh, being a standard uh, for the space around it. Um, this idea is not new and it's circulating in Europe as well, universities as cities of the future, universities setting the tone, universities um, being normative spaces, spreading their norms, including their norms of using space. Um, I think that the pandemic has created a lot of demand for intellectual leadership and for normative leadership, if we can call it that. Um, and we can, this is a unique historical moment when we can um, occupy the space uh, boldly uh, and by creating new practices, uh, testing them and spreading them, uh, make the surrounding spaces better. So that's all from me. I'm ready to take questions if there are any or to just hear comments, which would be even better. Uh, thank you, Dara. Uh, as for the questions, I believe that there will be many questions in the Zoom uh, chat. Uh, unfortunately, there is not so much time for live <laughs> Uh, communication with all our audience, maybe a little bit later. Uh, so uh, Dara was talking to us from a faraway place. It's in Irkutsk or near Irkutsk? Oh, it's Irkutsk. Uh, about four hours from Irkutsk. 
four hours from Irkutsk, close to Mongolia, just imagine, so far away. And uh, our next speaker, Pascali Leistra, is many thousand miles away from Dara, but she's with us. And she's talking from the Netherlands. Where in the Netherlands are you now? Pascal? Hello, Tatjana. Hello. Hi. I'm uh, actually in The Hague. You're in The Hague, uh, uh, in the capital. So the Netherlands have several capitals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tatjana. So in a way, The Hague is in the administrative capital. So uh, you're talking to us from the capital of the Netherlands. Yes, Let's and put for it us like today that. is important because today are the yeah. elections. Sorry, uh, for the, it's the political capital. Yeah. Political capital, right. Yeah. You are. Uh, so um, Pascal is uh, the Dutch architect. Actually, the Dutch architect is the global brand name. Uh, so Dutch architects are famous for the combining uh, just impossible things in one single practical project. Ingenuity combined with practicality. This is something like the mark of, Dutch, of the Dutch architecture. An important thing about Pascal is that she is the architecture of, let us say, knowledge transfer buildings. Uh, so her projects are about uh, universities development, libraries, knowledge centers, whatever. And uh, uh, another capacity of Pascal is that she is a lecturer in TU Delft, which is one of the most significant, I would say, European universities, Technical University of Delft. She teaches there. And there is still another capacity of Pascal, which I will add later, but right now the floor is yours. Please speak. Thank you very much, uh, Tatjana. I, uh, um, others than Dara, I do have uh, images, and maybe that's a bit more the architectural way of presenting. Uh, so actually, I do have quite a lot of uh, slides. So let's start. Okay, I hope you can see all my uh, first image. And I want to congratulate, of course, Letty for the 135 years of existing. Um, as Tajana already mentioned, I'm an architect. I'm passionate by education, educational buildings. I love to teach at the Technical University of Delft. Another passion I do have is uh, about historical buildings. Historical buildings of different eras, all having their own characteristics, all telling their own stories. I think that's marvelous. Next to that, I think the combination of existing buildings and new buildings can give a great match. For the discussion about the future of later, of uh, sorry, lately, um, I think it's good not to look only at the building scale, but to think, to think broader, to think out of borders, to think of uh, the campus scale. So education, education is changing, um, and I want to show it by uh, the campus of Letovo we did in Moscow. Mm, it's a modern, totally new building. But what if you want to have modern education and you do have a, an existing building, a historical building? To me, one of my favorite uh, buildings in that one is the Faculty of Architecture at uh, Technical University of Delft. Again, I think not only think on building scale, but think much more broader, think interdisciplinary, um, think as the campus can be an accelerator for other developments. And then I would like to come back to uh, the future of Leti. Okay, okay, this is maybe too obvious. But actually, okay, this picture is from about the uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century. Um, but education used to be for a long, long time like this. It used to be one-sided. Somewhere in the 70s, uh, education only changed. It became two-sided learning. It became interactive learning. It became uh, learning you can from every um, disciplinary. It became personalized learning. 
personalized learning. Oops, sorry. Personalized learning. What does it demand of uh, spaces? It demands a lot, a, var a variety of spaces. Spaces should be flexible. There should be place for interaction. There should be place for teamwork. There should be place for concentration. There should be place for interaction, for sharing new ideas, for brainstorming. And of course, there should be a place for recreation, playful moments. Maybe why not play ping pong? As mentioned, I would like to take you to our project in uh, Moscow, actually New Moscow. It's uh, called Letovo Campus, and it's about 45 minutes uh, drive from the city, from the center of Moscow. It's not yet connected by the metro, but on this picture uh, taken in 2016, you can see that the city of Moscow is approaching to this building site. On the foreground, actually, I hope you see my mouse, my cursor, you can see the layout of the school we designed for Letovo. Letovo, not only having a big school building, but also student housing, teachers' residence, a lot of outdoor uh, sports facility, and actually it's on a lovely green plot uh, in New Moscow. It's approximately uh, 20 acres of green, lovely space. Oh, sorry. I have... My mouse is a little bit, yeah. Um, in a, very briefly, the school building, it exists uh, when you enter the lobby, you come in a huge central hub. The central hub being a variety of social spaces next to each other. The central hub is connecting three wings. The art wing in the northwest. On the south um, uh, west, you find teaching facilities and you do have a huge sports wing with all kinds of lovely, lovely sports. Already mentioning, when you enter the school, you uh, confront the central hub, the central hub with a lot of nice social spaces. But not only, um, sorry, when we got the commission, uh, the client asked us to make it also possible to have events for up to 1,000 people. So in September 2018, when the school was opened, it happened that the thousand people could celebrate the first day of Letovo campus. I want to zoom in a little bit on this uh, uh, quite ingenious space. And indeed, ingenious, uh, why? Because it does have an auditorium for 200 people. When you open the sliding doors, it's going to be part of the central hub. On top of this uh, closed auditorium, you find this open tribune staircase, this tribune staircase for informal talks, social talks for the students. When you look down again to the stage, you see the stage, the stage being be, uh, used, double used for dance, for dance studios. You see the bar and the mirror in the back. So uh, in Holland, we think often about money and money to um, spend little money with great results. I think uh, <laughs> that was also kind of a commission we got from this client. If we go to a, a teaching wing, um, we had a close discussion with uh, the client, of course, about how to teach. And maybe you heard about schools without classrooms, but actually this particular client did not want to have a school without classrooms. They really believe still in the traditional classroom. Although the classroom um, opens fully, uh, you see all the different uh, classrooms, uh, the <clears throat> it opens fully to the recreational space. The recreational space with, again, all kinds of different learning spaces for group works, for teamwork, for working individually. And actually, at the end of the, of the recreational space is this nice, uh, a uh, relax zone where you can overview the whole campus area. These are some uh, images of the recreational space, and you see uh, a site 
the classrooms. And they have different color palettes on each uh, floor. And whereas the <clears throat> science labs on the first floor, they do have big vitrines. There's a huge aquarium. And actually, it's not that lively yet, but these uh, photos were taken when the school, uh, before opening uh, the school. So it's still a bit sterile, but uh, if you go there, you should, then you can see how, how great space it is. It is. Of course, school has a, a library, but there are not too many books. Again, also the library, it's more about learning spaces, about social spaces. Uh, adjusted to, sorry, the, some more social learning spaces. Adjusted to the library is this greenhouse. The greenhouse, again, it's getting boring. Uh, social spaces, places to chill. And actually, there can also be huge expositions uh, in this space. Student life, it's not only, of course, about learning. It's also about good food. And I believe that um, working optimal, and now we're sitting indoors, like Dara already mentioned, how um, me, myself, I go and try to bike every day to, to, <laughs> to see something of the world, eh? because otherwise my lovely room, although I'm in contact with you, uh, is getting a bit small. But to me, um, I really need to uh, do some exercise. And uh, for me, it's um, biking. But um, in Letovo, there is this huge, nice uh, um, sports hall. They have martial arts. They do have fitness and um, a lovely swimming pool looking towards the uh, campus area. Oh. Yes, with the client, we often had discussions about the weather. It, uh, it's almost like in Holland. We often talk about the weather. Um, but yes, also Moscow, although then schools are close, or maybe in Russia, does, does have, uh, of course, also lovely weather, even better, I think, than in Holland during summers. Um, so. Um, Yes, also outdoor life should be taken in account. And um, this is uh, my presentation about Letovo. But now, what? Okay, Letovo was an educational program with a new building. But what if you have changing ideas about education and you have a fixed building, an historical building? Um, I would like to make a small differentiation between uh, heritage uh, buildings. I think to me it's important to say you do have the heritage buildings with high values, high values that you, you don't want to touch, harm and change anything. Uh, actually, this is at the University of Leiden and um, it's this toga space. I saw it's the same word in Russia and in English gown space. I didn't know. So the toga space. and you do have this space, it's, it's quite exceptional. It's called the sweat room, literally uh, translated from Dutch. And um, talking about physical uh, experience, when you graduate from the uh, University of Leiden, uh, you are allowed to write on the wall, on this wall. And it's already allowed for centuries. I haven't graduated from Leiden University, um, and I haven't been in this sweat room, but how marvelous it would be to write your name next to, <laughs> to I don't know who. So these, these were high, highly valued uh, buildings. Um, there is another chapter of buildings, monumented listed buildings, uh, which have somehow lower value. And maybe the value uh, to me as an architect I think this uh, fifth building from the 50s, uh, I love it. But um, I think a lot of people think, mm, I, I'd prefer to have a new building. Actually, the client, we won this competition in 2012. Uh, they were quite a bit sad, unhappy, that they uh, had to take care that they had to remain the building from the 50s. Uh, the school building from the 50s uh, had to be uh, transformed into a modern building from the uh, 21st century. 
So what we did is we uh, opened the plinth to show the activities from the school. And uh, during the process, we tried to explain to the clients that they were lucky to have this existing building. For example, the workshop spaces they now have, you see them with all the uh, shed roofs. The, the workshop spaces they would never ever get in a new school building. In, in that case, they would be small, they would uh, less high, and they would be less uh, attractive as they are now. So to me, there are those uh, monu monumental buildings with lower value. Um, what happened in 2008? Actually, we go back, we go to the Faculty of Architecture in Delft. In 2008, the faculty burned down. It, for, for me, for a lot of people who were at this university, it was a national disaster. I even almost cried. <laughs> we had our lovely student times uh, over there and it burned down. Um, then it burned down in May and the students, of course, had to take their courses again next day after the fire. But even, of course, what uh, in September, when the new academical year started, they, they had to uh, had a real uh, building again. Um, so people thought, well, this uh, empty uh, building, it's for the uh, for chemistry uh, faculty in Delft. They, they mentioned, well, uh, faculty of architecture, you can have this one um, and do something with it. It's a lovely building from the outside. It's great. It looks monumental. But from the inside, it had horrible hallways, two small spaces. There was no um, modern room. It was not inspiring. There was a bad climate, all kind of, of pity uh, things. Then a great team of Dutch uh, uh, colleagues, they got the commission to transform this building. And they had some really smart interventions. One thing they did, it, they covered outdoor uh, spaces, outdoor courtyards. Uh, actually, maybe you know the, the firm OctaTube, they make spatial roof constructions. So they added two big spaces to the complex. And another very important thing, uh, there was really bad wayfinding in the old existing building. And what they did, they make, made a big street, a boulevard, which connected all the different spaces. Here you get a glimpse of this uh, street, this boulevard. And as you can see, um, you don't experience an old an old fashioned building. You feel a dynamic, inviting space. Um, you see all technical um, ducts um, clearly visible on the ceiling, so they're not covered. It's a bit a raw style, but really very inviting to me. Oh, sorry. Oops. Another way. Um, here you see the, the model room, of course, very important. Uh, for architectural students, although everything can be digital, uh, to me, this model making, working with cardboard is still very important. Um, and uh, happily also uh, university, things like that. So there is a huge, great model uh, space. And one of my favorites is um, the other big space. Mm. Okay. Next slide. No, it's sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, my favorite space. Maybe you. Yeah, probably you, you know this one. It's the so-called orange staircase from MVDV from Winnie Maas, and it's a brilliant, vi very vibrant space to be there. And you see also the three-dimensional uh, framework uh, bearing the roof. Mm. Um, okay, I think on the inside, it's really great that you can create an industrial, more playful environment, whereas because of the monumental list, uh, listed um, state of the building, 
it's a bit more formal. One hint I would like to give you to, uh, for Leti is think about the roof, think about the attic. Often, attics in former days have really lovely uh, roof uh, roofs where you can make beautiful workshop spaces like uh, which have been made in uh, Delft. Monumental from the outside. And I think this is a really brilliant idea to have ducks hidden in the former lion's head. Okay, not thinking only about the building scale, skill, but think broader. Think about uh, working interdisciplinary. Think about working together with other universities. Um, yes, I go to Delft University. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I need to do something with my mouse. Okay, sorry. Um, so, Delft Technical University first started in 1842. It's a bit older than Leti, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it started in the old historical city center. In the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they expanded. They expanded at this part of the site. Then in the 60s, they thought, well, uh, uh, Delft Technical University was really booming and they, wanted, they, had, they needed to have much more space. And as you can see on this picture, the uh, historical city center and the extension, they are almost uh, uh, big as they are. Oh, sorry, again. Oops. And this is what happened in the 60s. The new technical uh, university campus, it had a main street, a boulevard with all faculties uh, on both sides of this street. Uh, you had the civil engineering, all kind of uh, faculties. But in 30 years, sorry, and, and in the 60s, they were brand new buildings. Everybody was very proud of them. But in 30 years, they became, again, a bit old fashioned. Uh, there were too many cars. There was too little green. So in the mid 90s, this uh, architectural office, well known Meccano, they got the commission to uh, make the uh, campus of TU Delft again comfortable. And that they really did a great job. They made it green. They abandoned the cars. Actually, they put the cars to both sides of the campus and it became a lively spot again. As you can see on this picture, they really made space again for pedestrians, for bikers, a uh, lovely, comfortable space. Oh. Another thing, movement in uh, a te technical uh, uh, university of Delft is don't think on your own faculty. A faculty building, uh, it's nice to talk with colleagues, but it's, it can be even more nice to talk interdisciplinary. So there was this idea to make a building interdisciplinary, not only stay in your own building, on your own faculty, but in this building called Pulse, you, uh, students from all the different faculties, they come and join. There are learning spaces, there are lots of lecture spaces, and of course, again, there is nice food, food from all cuisines from all over the world. It's, it's really a great pleasure to be in this uh, building. And one other, um, ooh, my mouse, yes. Okay, um, one other latest point I would like to address to today. Um, of innovations of uh, Technical University of Delft is the Science Center in Delft. The Science Center, actually, it connects both students, industry, and uh, city of Delft. Students and industry, they make great uh, futuristic um, products. Huh? You, you Maybe you, you know this racing car, which is in the desert of Australia, reaching, I don't know, how, how many uh, kilometer per hour uh, racing uh, parts. Um, but it's all exhibited uh, again in an old building, in a 19th century building, and led by students and again, students, industry, and city they meet in this one. Letty. Um, of course, I'm quite far away from uh, St. Petersburg, but what I saw. Uh, by all the nice movies you made. 
Um, there is an amazing collection of all kinds of treasures. I think what you have, it, it's really a treasure, and I think uh, really have it well remained. I saw you also have a very interesting neighbor. It's the Botanical Garden. So I see potential for you, maybe even to connect with this uh, nice neighbor. Mm. I do have a few commandments for you. I think preserve your treasures well. Show what Leti stands for, because I think when you're walking around, uh, you don't. it feels a little bit like a fortress. You don't really see what's going on. So show it to the people. For the heritage part, make a valuation matrix. List what is really highly valued and what's lower valued so you know where to make new incisions or where you should keep the beautiful old heritage. Make a master plan. Maybe you already did it, but I don't know it that well. But make a master plan so you always can check whether you're on the right uh, way. Find new partners. Co-create, uh, maybe there is a great link with the botanical garden. Make a dynamic planning, not only for now, but for the next 15, next uh, 50 years. And yes, start the contest. Leti, ready for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. What, a, what an inspiring presentation with so beautiful uh, pictures. Uh, but before moving on, I should mention uh, the third capacity of Pascal. Uh, she has kindly agreed to be the member of the jury uh, in our contest for young architects, but we will tell about the contest later. Uh, so by this, we actually uh, are at the equator of our discussion. We have had the opening speech, two keynote speeches, and now we are getting down to practical cases. Uh, from the Netherlands, we are moving or flying or transferring to Italy, uh, exactly to the south of Italy. This is the University of Salenta. And our next speaker, Antoniela Longer, Associate Professor of the University of Salenta. And another transfer is from real spaces to virtual spaces, virtual, remote, and quite revolutionary ways of delivering knowledge, new learning spaces. Antoniela, Antoniela you are welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my uh, screen. Uh, do you see? Okay. Do you see my screen now? Okay. So thank you very much for your invitation. It was really a pleasure for me because uh, um, actually um, education is my passion. Uh, education spaces are my patient, uh, even if uh, I'm a computer engineer. So uh, I usually work uh, with databases, uh, with data management. So I usually work with the virtual um, world. Actually, uh, I have been doing a, a really uh, exciting experience at my university at the moment. Because uh, uh, even if uh, uh, our university is uh, quite young uh, compared with the others already uh, present, we are here on the hill of the boot, so in the middle of the Mediterranean area. And from this point of view, we are natively inclusive and we, are, we must be natively international uh, in, the, in the heart of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we are uh, a medium university, so uh, we, um, we have uh, several uh, academic staff, research people, 
uh, more than 50 degree programs and uh, 70k students which lead the city. Lecce is uh, an ancient city from the Roman uh, period. Uh, and it is grow, uh, grew around uh, uh, the city center, the historical center, but uh, it, the, his growth is spe speed up, has been speed up by the presence of students. Now, uh, DEFI, uh, DEFI the, the Department of uh, Engineering, uh, Engineering for Innovation, uh, was born uh, in IT, so it's quite young. But um, it's a pretty, um, uh, pretty exciting thing there because uh, we, we work in a really interdisciplinary approach in the engineering field. Uh, there are quite big, uh, a lot of sectors with uh, um, graduate students uh, from the master class, bachelors, and two schools of, uh, in, uh, of the PhD schools. We have uh, a lot of labs and a lot of research centers, and uh, physically, we are out from the uh, city center. We are in a, in a campus. Uh, here you can see the uh, multidisciplinarity of our uh, topics, from renewable energy to civil engineering uh, to ICT, nanotechnologies, management engineering, uh, robotics, biotechnologies, uh, um, nanotechnologies, aerospace engineering. And all of these needs a lot of experiments and experimental areas. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, international cooperation. The department is uh, really engaged in an extensive array of research partners with other universities, government, and in industries in Italy and in the EU. And we are natively pushed to internationalization and inclusion. Now, uh, we our facilities is growing and growing. As you can see here, there is a, a 1.5 k square meters of labs, uh, which are which have been built in for uh, two three years now. We have very um, newly and uh, renovated equipment. Uh, for from all the topics we treat and new spaces are coming uh, like this uh, these spaces are newly in conception in the sense that they are uh, from the design point of view more um, exciting you see this s building um, uh, but uh, uh, what we are trying to do uh, at the moment is to work uh, and create uh, hybrid spaces where students and lecturers can interact physically, virtually, and uh, in new blended ways. Uh, this is the reason why we are um, working and we are interpreting the concept of uh, extended classroom, extended laboratories. Uh, you can see on the left uh, our rooms, our open spaces where we have uh, also lectures in, in these very, very, very nice buildings, ancient buildings. But today, uh, all because of the pandemic, but because also of the new uh, approaches towards internationalization, um, the universities is moving from the physical to the international approach. So our classroom, our lectures are blended in physically and uh, um, virtual. So we can host um, lectures from all over the world, even if uh, they can't physically stay with us. It is fundamental to, for, in, for inclusion, because not all our students can go abroad, but uh, uh, smelling the international approach is uh, fundamental for our culture. 
uh, not only lectures, but also um, learning space and uh, work in teams from the physical uh, 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 students' rooms. We now are working for creating collaborative online international learning programs where um, in, uh, international teams uh, uh, of students work virtually uh, uh, to achieve some project work activity. But uh, we have also moved our uh, this conception and this new interpretation, interpretation in uh, um, augmented lectures. We uh, have uh, a very active lab, ABR lab, which is uh, focused on augmented reality, virtual reality. So we are um, uh, adding uh, augmented reality facilities to our classroom. What is a, 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 a chemical lecture uh, if you can see our molecules? How they can uh, they can be mixed? What if uh, you were in a mechanical lab, in a propulsion lab, and see how the uh, equipment, the engine, is um, uh, is made inside through visuals? But um, augmented classes, augmented lectures. Uh, are also uh, put together with uh, virtual labs. Virtual labs are virtual spaces where students can do experiments. We have uh, several different virtual labs. Some of them are part of the European and uh, the, uh, the world facilities, and we use them. So we push our uh, lecturers and our researchers to use virtual facilities because they extend and they include and they permit all students to stay in a lab, even if the, uh, the labs uh, have physical um, uh, close strict sizes, using the virtual labs, we can open these spaces. So from the, uh, the idea of having simulations uh, or virtual environment for computer and, uh, and uh, in, uh, information technologies experiments, we move to what you can see on the right, which are our labs. This is the centrifugal pump of our university. And, uh, through specific uh, uh, virtual activities, we have virtualized them in the sense that students can um, do experiment on the simulated environment, but it is like being in the physical one. Not for all, but it is very, uh, very funny. What we are also trying to work on is to create massive online open labs, taking our experiment out of the labs and work in cities. For doing this, we have, uh, we have conceived specific platform which provide us with measurement of, in this case, of the environmental space, and then students can have their experiment in the city as part of uh, um, citizen science projects. Not, not less important are the concepts of remote laboratories. If virtual laboratories are fantastic for educational purposes, because we have no limits, no barrier from the physical point of view, from the safety point of view. Virtual uh, remote laboratories are laboratories where we can remotely uh, interact with equipment. We have uh, elaborated the concept of collaborative laboratories as a service. 
So we have platforms where, um, and uh, spaces in, uh, in video conferences where uh, students can uh, interact, in this case, with an electron microscope, and they um, can do their own experiment in a virtual class which is different from what usually uh, happens now, where a single student can um, interact with also remotely with one equipment. But uh, the, uh, the, the, dimension, the, the, the dimension of the uh, collaboration in, this, in, the, in the first case is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is not present. This is the why uh, the reason why we have conceived these new uh, these new spaces. Uh, so, at the end, um, what we are doing currently at our department is exactly uh, this uh, um, this extension, this approach, opening uh, the physical environment to virtual to virtuality. But uh, considering also blended, uh, blended um, uh, chances. For any question, you can I'm available today and also in other uh, uh, later uh, through, uh, through my email. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Antonella. Great. So living in such a nice environment in the south of little Italy, you're thinking about virtual laboratories. I believe it's quite warm now in, in, it is. in, <laughs> around, in your environment around yes. the university. Yes, but we is. should but we should take your word that we will have these virtual sessions, your students in your virtual laboratory and our students, okay? working in your virtual laboratory and they would imagine that they're in Lecce and doing those experiments in that nice picture which you showed or near it yeah, in one of the virtual rooms of Unisalente. Thank you very much indeed. Actually, we need uh, for internationalization and for inclusion, yeah. and for opening uh, barriers uh, and destroying barriers for our students. Yeah, is, yeah. Uh, is kind of uh, digital technologies. This is the reason why we are moving in this direction. Yeah, thank you very much once again. And uh, now we're getting back to the Netherlands. Uh, Jasper, I hope that you're here. I'm here. Yeah, great. Jasper, uh, he was, uh, he's thanks uh, to uh, Nafik Nesser. They found him for us. And uh, because uh, Jasper is a leader of a unique project uh, of learning space transformation. And I was just very much impressed by kind of a motto, slogan, which I found uh, in his information. Uh, it's, it will be my interpretation of what he means. He sa it says that it's not the space which shapes the learning mode, but this is the learning mode which should shape the space, quite revolutionary. Uh, so please, Jasper, the floor is yours. Tell us about the Utrecht University developments. I will, thank you, thank you. Um, I just share my presentation with you. You can see it, I guess. Okay, so um, I work as a project manager for educational innovations at Utrecht University. Our university is a research-led, broad university um, with about uh, 30,000 students. Um, and now I work on educational innovations, but I've not always worked on educational innovations as a project manager, because before this, um, I used to be a teacher in the biology department. So. Um, just to give you a sense of what that looked like, this is me about five years ago. And I'm very excited here because I just transformed my own teaching, my own course uh, into a, a, a flipped classroom. So that means that uh, my students had prepared themselves online before they would go to campus and have, uh, have the class with me. 
And I did this because I wanted to act as a teacher in, in line with the educational vision of our university. So active learning, collaborative learning, uh, blended learning. Um, and I had seen that all my students indeed had prepared themselves online before class would start. So I was, was very happy about that. But then I entered my classroom and it looked like this. And um, well, th this didn't really make me happy because there wasn't enough space to make any groups with my students. Um, I couldn't reach my students. So I had the idea that I would be more like kind of like a coach and talking to my students, but I couldn't reach them. To make matters worse, all the tables were connected with these power cables. So um, I really felt uh, limited by the classroom, you could say. Luckily, luckily for me, the next year, the teaching and learning lab, or teaching and learning lab was uh, realized and I uh, had a part in that. So next, the next year I could let go of the limiting classroom and I could design my own classroom for my own course. So the next year, uh, this is me again. Now, uh, and uh, I was again very excited, but now I had designed my own classroom. So it looked a bit like this. So I was operating from the center of the room. There were uh, high in height adjustable tables with whiteboards and screens for each table. And this was a completely different experience for me. So what I experienced was that I had a lot better insight in, into the learning process of my students because I could see what they were doing on the screen. I had better contact with my students and I could manage the energy level better. So uh, literally my students could go on longer um, uh, on the day. And my students said we had better interaction with the teacher, we could collaborate better together. Um, and as icing on the cake, the um, the appreciation for my course uh, skyrocketed. So very happy indeed. And as a teacher, this was kind of a, a, a transformative experience, you could say. Um, because I thought, well, when I can have this experience as a teacher, this is, a, I, I, my, my course tremendously improved because of the learning space. I want other teachers, my colleagues, to have that same kind of experience. And we can only do that by also transforming uh, our buildings, our learning spaces at university. So these are two kind of landmark buildings from my university. Um, so that was, uh, well, after some, uh, a lot of talking to a lot of people, I could start with uh, the project Future Learning Spaces. And indeed, as uh, Tatiana already mentioned this, um, this project uh, starts from, well, this quote, so our learning spaces shouldn't shape our teaching, but our teaching should shape our learning spaces. So I have a very, um, so my perspective for today will be a very uh, educational uh, perspective that I would like to bring to you. So the project Future Learning Spaces, uh, how is it set up? Well, what we first did was we took a look, a close look to our vision on education at Utrecht University. And from that vision, we distilled uh, the, the core elements and, um, and translated that into didactical principles for the physical learning environment. Then we have concept development. So we design concepts that we think can contribute to these didactical principles and from that, we want to realize uh, pilot spaces to check if they indeed improve our teaching and learning. So uh, zoom in, zooming in a little bit. So our vision on education consists uh, of these core elements. All, so like uh, active learning, blended learning, flexible, multidisciplinary, with societal impact, et cetera, et cetera. And we've translated those into six didactical um, principles. So just to give uh, an example of three principles, we say that learning spaces should give incentive for interaction from students with fellow students, with teachers, with the learning content, maybe special materials. We said that our learning space should enhance diversification of learning activities. So we think it is important to be able to have a 
a, a, a diverse set of learning activities that you can do within the learning space. And we believe for our teaching model that it is important that the learning spaces are student-centered and not teacher-centered. So the teacher can give a lecture, they can give instructions, but that's not the primary teaching method we would strive for. Um, so these are the didactical principles. And then we uh, try to translate these principles into new concepts or concepts that fit well with our educational model. So how do we do that? Well, we've um, first we've developed uh, some inspiration cards and these are uh, inspiration cards. I can, oh, where's the chat? Let me put it in. Oh, I just lost. Mm. I lost the chat button somehow. Maybe uh, in, a, in a minute I found it and then I will put the link to these inspiration cards into the chat. So you can make use of them uh, for yourself. These are 24 principles that kind of um, relate the physical environment or, or the learning space to a certain educational goals. So for instance, if you want to have more interaction between students in your learning space, well, how can you, how can you uh, make sure that will happen within the learning space design? Um, and uh, we let our teachers and our students in several sessions discuss this, and and then um, make prototypes, rap rapid prototyping with uh, Lego. So uh, this uh, is a very fun, a fun activity to do, of course, also for our uh, teachers, uh, but it's also very insightful. Um, uh, very insightful to see with what kind of solutions they com come up with, and also to see if there are any patterns arising. So what kinds of solutions are interesting and, and um, do you think uh, uh, occur, occur more often? So then stage two, indeed, we identify these emerging patterns. We sell, select what, okay, what kind of goals do we want to reach with our uh, concepts and then refine the concept in a co-creation community. So we have now a co-creation community of a uh, more than 50 students, teachers, and, uh, and experts. And in this community, we literally say, okay, we want to uh, adapt this uh, learning space. This is our, our ID, but now you can think along with us and think with us how to improve our concept. That's what we do in these sessions. So some pilots. Um, so this is like what the, what the traditional learning space looked like uh, in one of our buildings. And uh, this is an example of what we've made. So this is more like a hands-on uh, learning space with a flexible furniture, um, not that much technology in this, in this case. Um, and you can see that there's a different, um, Oh, I think I've. No. There's a that uh, you can see there's a different position for the teacher because there is no position for the teacher. He is walking around. Um, this is another uh, like an active learning classroom with more technology with an interactive wall uh, on the on the right side. So that's this is uh, like a touch touch very big touch screen. Um, these kinds of screens for the for the students and uh, also um, webcams to make uh, hybrid teaching and learning possible. And this is our virtual classroom, so this is more like a virtual environment. We uh, we've realized we we've also all kinds of plans, of course. So these are some concepts concepts that are work in progress. So first, this is an active learning classroom, again, where the, the teacher uh, operates from the middle of the room. Uh, what we want to do with this classroom is we want to make it hybrid. And we are in the middle of 
thinking uh, very uh, hard how to do that so that we can uh, actually work in mixed groups of uh, students uh, at location and students online, but also change between like uh, group work and more central instruction and central discussions. Uh, and that's quite a challenge uh, technically and, didact and uh, in the didactic uh, sense. So we are working on that uh, at the moment. This is another one. So the left uh, picture is uh, something we sketched for ourselves, like we would like to have some kind of collaborative lecture hall, so a big hall with more than 100 students, but then a hall in which we could um, have a more diverse set of learning activities. And then some months later, um, we found out that uh, this kind of hall was already realized in Amsterdam. So that's the right, uh, right picture. And as you can see, students can easily turn their chair to form groups and all the students are uh, can be reached by the by the teacher and uh, there are also like microphones etc to uh, to facilitate um, group discussions then i guess the last one and most ambitious one is something we call a learning plaza and in this learning plaza this is a formal and informal uh, learning space at the same time and um, that consists of several corners in which uh, which are very suitable for several kinds of learning activities. And the idea is that multiple courses uh, and informal learning can take place at the same time in this space. Um, so I also have some, some tips for you for the contest. As you already found out, I am very. Uh, I have a starting point from the didactic point of view. So I would say, first start with your educational vision and goals. Um, try to involve students, teachers, and experts in the design process, and then let them first think about the ideal teaching and learning practices, and then about the learning spaces. So you will you will have to guide them. Uh, through that process and not just ask them about the ideal learning spaces and inspire them to come up with creative solutions and begin to identify the patterns that arise uh, and make use of those patterns uh, and start designing from those patterns. Now, let me see if I can find the chat. chat. Ah, found it. Great. Okay. So um, in the chat, you can find the inspiration cards that we've developed, and you can make use of them if you want to. There's also a kind of a short manual with it um, to use if you'd like. Okay. So this was my short 10-minute presentation. Thank you. Jasper, thank you ever so much. You gave us such wonderful tips. First of all, all students who are present here, we should act on your advice. We should act on your tips. They will be involved in developing learning plazas, new creative spaces in Leti. That's a key. And another thing which is also important. Uh, so thank you very much. It's very insightful. And we are planning uh, new events, maybe for educators, about new formats of learning, new formats of education. Will you, would you accept our invitation to speak there? Well, if, yeah. You yeah. cannot say no now. <laughs> no, 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 of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm, I would be happy I'm, to. I'm to the join. manipulator, sorry, using you as, <laughs> using your presence and big audience. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now we are moving on. And um, uh, from uh, the Netherlands, we are moving to Finland. I hope that Ari is here. Ari, are you here? Not yes. Yet? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Just wonderful. We just did everything to uh, do this timing. I, I had to be at a different important meeting. So he was for some time not with us, but he is back. 
Ari, this is your turn. Now it's going to be quite a practical uh, example of the heritage utilization. Former Imperial Russian barracks, the military base converted into, and Ari will, will tell us into what uh, the Ksamk University, our great partner, uh, in international projects into what uh, the military uh, base can be converted. Thank, you're welcome. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm very honored and pleased to be with you and, and uh, lucky that I can have this presentation. I just uh, ask one practical question that do you want me to share in the way my or, or do you share from their presentation? And you, you are able to see now something? Uh, we see a nice girl with her back. Yes, yes, back. that's what you are supposed to see. But she's not looking at us, yeah. <laughs> not yet. Okay, she's our student, <laughs> our student is looking at the forest which is uh, uh, Finland is uh, made of. So greetings from southeastern Finland, and this is just thirty kilometers north from where I uh, I'm currently situated in the middle of the city of Kouvola. It's the National Park of Repovesi. But that's our slogan, all for the future, or know the, know the future, know the tomorrow, and feel the tomorrow. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about the building inspiring learning and working spaces on the, on the basis of values of old and new. And uh, the case is uh, really the uh, former Russian Imperial Russian military base, which was originally built in the early 1910s. And uh, I have uh, sort of prepared this pre presentation with my great colleague Laura Lehtinen, who, who I suppose is also listening to this presentation, and also Director of Education of our Culture and Design Department, Jommi Fagerström, who is, who is an uh, interior designer by, by profession. So, what, where, and why? Uh, so we are in the southeastern Finland, uh, somewhere halfway between Helsinki and Saint Petersburg on this old railway line, and it's just two hours from here by train to by Allegro to Saint Petersburg, and same same to little less to Helsinki. And then this place where our Kovala campus, we have four four campuses in four cities, but this Kovala campus is based on a military base and, and it was also used for Finnish military until 1989. After that it was re renovated and the redevelopment for the actually for the use of the University of Helsinki for its translation department of languages and translation. And it mainly consists of these three historical layers uh, from the original times, early 19th, and then, then some add-ons add the, in the 50s, and then this what has happened post-90s, the renovation, interior rest renovation, and then, then later also this major rebuilding. And so 10 years ago, it was finished this uh, Roughly 20 million euro by a design studio building by uh, designed by architects uh, NRT Limited, the Finnish architectural company. And here, here you see some some pictures from the old military base. And and if you are are able to catch the link there, you can of course go and see the virtual tour in which you can also go inside the buildings, etc. But there it was important, some of the values that we decipher from their security and sturdy and long lasting, also the historical look and fairly hierarchical also in, in its uh, outlook. And it is all the buildings have been built around the square as a kind of defensive uh, arrangement. And then later when used in also in uh, 
education use, they, they hosted quite traditional or traditional classrooms in which uh, theory has been passed on to the future generations. And then this is the new add-on, which you see already in the, in the first picture part of it, which is built on a slope, small slope next to, next to the main building and, and between the main building and the, the old shooting range, which is like 300 meters long. And there, some values were that it needs to have good light because it was mainly uh, purposed for the design department and, and handling of uh, and working with different materials from metal to plastic to wood, etc. And the goal was to have a very transparent building. And as you see in the picture, down uh, on, in the bottom on the ground floor, there are glass walls, and those glass walls are everywhere. So all the workshops that are there in the downstairs, there is 100 meters of them, roughly 10, 10 big rooms with machinery and etc. They have glass walls and also glass walls to the outer, outer space. And to have some flow and then also showroom space and so that it can be used for also other purposes than just uh, sort of design purposes, that there can be multidisciplinary activities. But it was still, still this also this new interestingly was built to last and the concrete, uh, a concrete building was meant or is meant to last 150 years, which is quite interesting. So there is in a way some, something of a, a kind of this kind of bunker-like uh, element there. And this was mainly then not meant for the theory, but for practice and experimentation. And, and very so that I mean the all this transparency and the, the any, any furniture that there is uh, will facilitate peer relationships between uh, students, but also between students and uh, uh, their mentors and teachers. So it's a very democratic idea. And there on the right hand, there is a picture of the, in the similar style. The main building uh, has a third floor, which is from the 50s era, so from the mid era, and that, that there, there we had the possibility of making also the or implement the values of transparency and light, so that the whole third floor is basically I mean transparent. But the, on the first two floors, it was not allowed that kind of uh, arrangement. But in, in the first and second floor, which are the uh, from the early 90s, there there still it was possible within the uh, rules and regulations of the uh, heritage buildings, it was uh, able to have some some glass walls between the corridor and the glass rooms. So basically, I mean, I think my message and our message is here that we we think that I mean this way of uh, adding new new values to the old uh, heritage buildings uh, builds a kind of integrated values for sort of historically uh, conscious way of being. And uh, it will, I think, manifest also then and carry on to the learning and, and the uh, growth of, of individuals who actually attend these kind of facilities. And it shows clearly, there's clearly visible these three layers, mainly these three layers that there is something from the original and then something has been in the middle in the 50s and, and then the new sediments. And, and it helps to those people who are engaged with these constructions and constructs and these buildings can can also see the continuity from this uh, to the future. So that I mean, 
we can start imagining what would be the next next or fourth layer. And like here, it has been used this contrast with the modern architecture uh, linked uh, to the historical buildings, and it still may may mediate continuity, even though for some people, and we have of course heard some criticism also in the community that there is too much contrast. But uh, I mean, once you get think about it, I mean, there can be continuity still. And uh, important thing which we get from the integration of, of so that not demolishing all the old stuff is the variability so that it stimulates the senses and, and gives the possibility of plasticity and, and also beauty and, and this variability is very important for, for each of us, for our vitality. And then these values beautifully, I would say, complement each other. And uh, very much, in a way, to the core of what is the mission of Universities of Applied Sciences is this a combination of theory and practices. It's actually the, so this, uh, our campus, I would say, manifest the, the slogan of the, all the Finnish universities of uh, applied sciences and as they when they say that they they are or they claim to be better in combining theory and practice than for instance traditional universities but of course like we notice and perhaps you have touched upon this uh, in previous uh, presentations this our present day we have also been over now over a year in in remote mode in, in teaching and also in R&D. And of course, our management is thinking about, okay, how, how much we need learning spaces and physical learning spaces. And, and uh, the question then remains, how, how will this change? And uh, I think one good thing is that uh, if we think about the design design sort of department and the it is important to i think also in the future to be in touch with the materials that we are surrounded with so so in that sense we still will need some spaces where we can touch things and then uh, maybe maybe add more more these virtual and digital layers to it and which eventually means that I mean, some of the old, sty old style uh, theory, theory, I mean, classroom spaces for the learning theory, uh, the, the need for them will diminish. I will stop my. Hopefully, this was a ten-minute presentation. Thank you very much. And this is from the other side, the main building, and there you see the. Third floor, clear, the third floor clearly the 50s and then the original two floors and then on the right hand side this this which on the ground seems very small but then there is a vast vast new space which is all glass walled within contain, contained within the within the small slope. You, thank you very much. Thank you very yes. much. Uh, thank you really very much. So we've noticed uh, that Aksamk, uh, the Finnish uh, educators and uh, thinkers, uh, they really take long leaps from 150 to the present and from the present to uh, 150 years more, the future, which you are projecting for your university for these buildings. We have some questions in the chat. Actually, some have been already answered uh, in the chat itself. Uh, I think we'll have a brief chat time after the next speaker and before our concluding presentation, if nobody minds. So now we take uh, a long leap, but in the geographical space, it will be from Finland, from Ksamk to St. Petersburg. Andrei Surovenko, uh, 
our partner in the um, project, in the contest, which is mentioned many times, but not explained yet. Andrei Suravenkov will tell about the vision of the highly dense campuses, the concept. A dynamic presentation. Yesterday, Andrei said that he had 300 slides. Uh, uh, let us see how many slides he has now. No, not so many, of course. Not so many, 250. No, so Andrei, you have 10 minutes. We yes, have the audience slides. who are getting a little bit, uh, a little bit <laughs> fidgety. <laughs> so we hope it will be... Uh, a very dynamic presentation. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. I'll try my best. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, um, I want to present one of uh, our master's work, master's project, uh, which supports a very good idea about connecting, connecting and working together uh, business, students, industry, uh, so I will I will share my screen. Uh, can you can you see screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so today I would like to present to you a concept of a new public place that successfully supplements the usual functions of Russian style university. Uh, this place can become a scientific center with an important social function, joining together several universities into a research hub for the society with direct business participation. Uh, one of uh, the important challenges for modern Russia is to create a close interaction between science, education, business, and government to improve the cooperation between science and business. This will accelerate the innovations and reduce the time from the inception of a scientific idea to its practical realization as a business product. Uh, such an interaction can be encouraged by a facility that implements science popularization and involving citizens into research activities. Such an involvement may start at an amateur level, but then after appropriate education uh, can be promoted to the professional participation um, uh, with business and industry. Um, to address this task, it's useful to develop a special model with a particular structural and special composition. Uh, we believe that the best solution for this problem is to create a public space with a pronounced recreational function that will serve as a natural attraction point for the center visitors. Uh, for example, such a public space may be actively sought by business actors as well. Uh, for example, JetBrains, it's a Russian center at International Software Corporation, uh, have recently created scientific museums in Amsterdam and St. Petersburg to promote science among general audience. Um, the structure is in, in question provides both recreational function and the uh, functions relate to the scientific and commercial activity. Uh, the, the development of the structure is based on the experience of various businesses and organizations to which uh, universities, technology parks, museum quarters, etc. Uh, as the main function of the studied structure are the museum and recreation uh, and uh, also scientific functions. We choose the name uh, of this structure is uh, its Science and Museum Center, in short, CM, uh, SMC, sorry, SMC. And the main goal of uh, such a center are uh, mutual visibility for science and business, uh, providing an opportunity for researchers to find business partners and investors and giving an opportunity to businesses to choose a, de a developer of uh, their project. Uh, science fair for business. Uh, it's a possibility to choose a research group to work with from many options. Uh, also, a kind of petri dish for startups. 
uh, creating maximally nurturing environment for birth and growth of new ideas and scientific organization and communities. Also open doors uh, into science. Um, it's about involving visitors uh, into scientific activities. Uh, and uh, last is science popularization, making science accessible for the most wide group of citizens uh, possible. Uh, the key objectives for the SMC developers is thus to create a comfortable, organic environment where all the stakeholders would be able to work uh, collectively on these goals. Uh, we have carried out an analysis of the structures currently present in St. Petersburg that are partially solving the problem of business, society and science inter interaction. The analysis criteria we choose uh, include the scientific activity, science popularization, higher education, meditation between science and business, introducing the amateur into uh, in the collective scientific, scientific activities. Uh, we found that no full analog for such a center currently, currently exists in St. Petersburg. Uh, thus, we decided to carry out an analysis of the facilities uh, that are similar to the um, center according to the presented criteria and are located in, in other cities. In particular, we have focused on the functional and planning structures. Um, this comparative analysis enabled us to figure out the main functional zones in the studied facilities. Finally, we have studied the relative importance of the functional zones and the interaction between the zones in the facilities in question and applicability uh, of the findings in the structure of the suggested SMC. Uh, the zones can be divided into several levels according to the degree of involvement into the scientific activities. Uh, level one, it's entertainment level is designed to popularize uh, science for the general audience. It includes exhibition zones and rec recreation zones. Level two, amateur level, is designed for the regular visitors of the SMC that not only visit um, the exposition, but are also involved into the amateur science through workshops, lab activities, etc. Uh, level three, it's professional level, is designed for the professional research activities that are related to the higher uh, education and research institutions and for promoting uh, interaction between business and the science. In particular, it can include, include office spaces for the high tech businesses and business research labs. Uh, um, the analysis carried out about allowed us to formulate several requirement, uh, requirements for the possible location of SMC. The area of SMC should be from 10 to 18 hectares, and uh, SMC, the center, should be located close to a technical university, research institutes, and high-tech industry. SMC should also be easily accessible by public transport. Um, the authors have found that the following functional zones should be included into SMC. Uh, research and development zone, science and education zone, commercial zone, uh, which includes cafe, restaurants, shops, etc. Business residence zone, business incubator zone, uh, also service zone uh, with information center, parking, and also other spaces. Um, also, it's art and recreation zone, uh, inclu included common spaces, clubs, green zones, etc., and exposition zones with exhibition facilities, facilities and storage rooms. Uh, the zones are connected by the transit framework, uh, which allows to organize the movement of the visitors. Um, uh, this framework includes communication space and also may include some of the zones listed above. Uh, also, it can host some of the commercial, recreational or exhibitional 
facilities. Uh, to fit the requirements, uh, this center should satisfy the authors choose uh, to place SMC close to Polytechnic University at the former location of the Television Research Institute. Uh, the site area is circa 11 hectares and it's situated um, 600 meters away from Polytechnic University. And it, it also is also relatively, relatively close to ETI University, ITMO University, uh, High School of Economic Campus uh, in St. Petersburg, also St. Petersburg Medical University. It is also close to some of the important uh, high-tech businesses, such as JetBrains, uh, Svetlana Electropribor, Yandex, uh, Lumo Factory, and others. Finally, it's adjacent to the Eofin Institute, one of the largest research institutions in Russia. Thus, such a placement allows to create common place for interaction between scientists, business people, and the students. Uh, one of the important objectives considered during the development of the complex was creation of a common recreation zone in, inside the quarter. This zone was designated to the multi-purpose leisure and communication zone. Uh, attracting the general audience into SMC. SMC. Uh, to create the recreational zone, the structure of SMC was uh, aligned with the um, uh, transit framework, uh, creating pedestrian transit from the subway station to the bus stops and residential areas. Uh, the compositional center of the site is a square with a green recreation zone. Uh, this uh, SMC center buildings located near um, transit framework host units divided by the access level with a designated set of zones in each of them. Uh, the part of uh, the units with domination with the domination of either recreational zone, exposition zone or commercial zone is either connected to the main communication space, uh, for example, for the shops and cafes or integrated in, into it. Uh, for example, IMAX cinema, um, playground area, etc. These units constitute common center that have public access level. Andre? Yes? If I, if I may interrupt you, you're running out of time. And oh. how, uh, um, well, how okay. much? S sorry, sorry, okay. Just I'll, one I'll, minute I can give you, but not uh -huh. more. <laughs> Okay, I will uh, show we now free the, free the pictures. Uh, will not explain more about uh, uh, plan or structure of this uh, center. So it just uh, I want to show uh, that we can um, uh, create a perfect and very interesting public uh, space with many facilities, which can uh, help us to connect business, students, uh, industry. Uh, together and involve uh, many people into the scientific work. So we um, believe that creating of such uh, common spaces will attract the general audience into science by creating recreational facilities. And so this center will also provide comfortable environment for interaction between researchers and business people. So and, uh, as a result, the universities will uh, enjoy significant expansions of the available uh, opportunities, both for attraction of a great greater amount of motivated applications, applicants, and for product, productive interaction with the business. So I, I think uh, such an interesting space it can help many universities to work together. And do you thank you very much? Thank you very it much. It was uh, a real exposure of little audience who are not architects, uh, but, but a way of thinking of an architect and a lecturer in architecture. Very interesting project. Geographically, in, in uh, the scale of St. Petersburg, it's the opposite part side of St. Petersburg. And uh, uh, we will have to deal together with you, together with them. Um, GASU is the acronym for St. Petersburg University 
of architecture and civil engineering. Actually, this is the knowledge center and the incubator of new projects. And one of them uh, has been presented to all of you uh, by Andre. Uh, now, uh, thank you once again. And, uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, I was asked by, uh, not everybody could um, ask questions in the chat. Uh, so uh, there are two questions in, to Dara. But actually, as I can see, uh, they are in a little bit similar, yeah? Uh, probably everybody was so impressed by this image, Emergence After Darkness, here yeah, by Murakami and other, other visions. So the question deals with the universities. What to prioritize? I'm summarizing the questions. What to prioritize in this new situation? after the lockdown, when you get get out after uh, out of lockdown. Dara, this is the question to you. Mm -hmm. What should university prioritize interaction now in the current situation? Mm -hmm. Interaction. I believe it should be interaction. It's not about physical or virtual. It should be about the intensity of interaction. So we should prioritize intense, meaningful interaction between different actors. And then, uh, depending on what kind of interaction we're talking about, decide on the specific dimensions of space, be it virtual or digital. So that is a general answer. It's, I think it's kind of um, an erroneous way to think about uh, universities of the future when we try to decide between digital and virtual or try to think about that how they will combine without first thinking about interactions that will be happening there. Thank you. And uh, I believe there will be more uh, questions to Dara because as for me, for example, I'm still digesting some notions, uh, for example, chance encounters or taking, uh, uh, tech zoning and all that. So we hope that we will be in contact, we'll stay in contact with you later and ask more questions. And now we are gradually moving to the conclusions. Uh, so I'm giving the floor to uh, Anastasia. Uh, this is, I would define it not as a final, but as a perspectives. Uh, so Anastasia, concludes the session. Yes, I think so. Not the final, <laughs> but I will try to announce uh, very many times mentioned contents and uh, a little bit summarize everything. Uh, first of all, thank you each of you for your wonderful, really wonderful and very, very interesting presentation. Uh, start from Dara, uh, with whom we are constantly thinking about developing, about internalization and other aspects. Uh, then Pascal, uh, who give us a lot of links about how can we develop our campus. It's one thanks, very, very great thanks, thanks from me and from our audience. Uh, then Antonella, uh, she spoke a lot about such kind of new spaces, virtual spaces, and uh, we we are wrote together project together. So for us, it's really very very wonderful, and I hope that we will continue this discussion. Uh, then uh, Jasper, thank you for your tips, and uh, as uh, Tatiana told, uh, we are waiting for you for the next discussion about educational formats, and I will announce it uh, in very soon, very soon time. Uh, so it was really wonderful, and um, your university, not only you, but a lot of uh, universities, such kind of benchmark also for our university and it's really a pleasure to see your examples your cases thank you then ari it's uh, our partner and uh, a very good friend <laughs> from as a lot of speakers today and uh, you show also very interesting project of uh, your university and uh, i'm really appreciate and very happy to hear it and uh, at least andre thank you for such kind of interesting project and uh, i am very hopeful that we will work together in a very nearest future. And uh, so it will be very, very soon. And uh, so now I ask my colleague to open my presentation. Galina, please open my presentation. And uh, I will announce about our very soon contents of young architects. 
Uh, so you see the timeline. Uh, we start from today and um, you can enter our website and uh, so all the contents. Um, we, we can organize a special virtual exposition for you. Uh, you have already seen our videos, but we can continue in a real time. And I hope that in the very nearest future and our foreign guests can can come to our university and not only foreign, but our local guests too. Uh, then um, at the end of the May, we are going to uh, finish this contest. And uh, in the middle of June, uh, we will show the best uh, project for our audience. And you see the September, I hope that until that time, we will uh, realize all our things, thoughts and ideas in a real life. Uh, so uh, we have uh, four zones for such kind of renovation in the very nearest future. And uh, the first one is uh, Vologdin Garden. You see the monument in the middle and uh, some places of our universities. Uh, you have already also saw, seen it at our, at our videos with our students. Uh, then the forum is the middle part of our campus, a very beautiful one. It's winter time, but you see not only winter time. In winter time, we um, uh, put our new year tree here in the middle. So it's <laughs> also such kind of central part. Uh, then American lounges. You see it's in our fifth building and we are also thinking about how to do it um, very very comfortable for our students that's why students are here and also with us thinking about our future our together future and physical and virtual and in any other way uh, and the last place is the entrance of our university you see the cube and uh, just the enter of the university we are also thinking how to renovate it how to do it more comfortable more convenient and modern <laughs> in a such kind of context uh, you see the jury uh, some of them are here and um, the director is the head of our jury and uh, certainly it will be um, more wider but this is the first view and uh, you can link to the contents website and uh, connect to us and uh, to take part in this in this such kind of uh, i hope uh, very fruitful and uh, interesting contest international contest thank you for your attention i hope that uh, we will see in each other in the nearest future uh, see each other in real life i hope that uh, pandemic situation will finish at least and uh, everything will be in a normal way thank you very much Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful speakers. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. And uh, uh, we'll see you in Leti. By the way, it was one of the very first questions which was not answered. How to get to Leti? How can people get here physically? Uh, so we, we will be organizing uh, tours here. So it's easy to apply and easy to come. Of course, right now we have, so to say, special regime for those, uh, for, for, the, for the entrance zones. Uh, but many of us have antibodies, got vaccinated with Sputnik V or something. Uh, so some of us are not wearing masks uh, and uh, we will be very happy to greet you here. Uh, thanks, uh, Novik Ness and the consulate and all present students, brave persons who are exposed to new kind of information. And until soon, everybody. Bye.